Welcome, Pewter Report readers, viewers, and listeners to the Pewter Post Game Show, a brand new edition of the Pewter Report podcast, where we will break down the Bucks and Panthers game. And Scott, through seven weeks of the season, the Bucks are exactly where we predicted them to be, which is in first place atop of the NFC South. That's exactly <laughs> what we all said was going to happen. Yeah. What we did not expect was that the Bucks would play what I am pretty sure is the worst NFL game in the history of this sport. It nah, was it wasn't that, it was bad. it wasn't that bad. It was I mean, pitiful, it, it was, was pitiful. egregious and it was awful. It was egregious. Lost, it was awful. The Bucks lost 21 to 3 yeah. to the 1 and 5 now 2 and 5 yeah. Carolina Panthers. I'm your host Matt Matera. Join with me is Scott Reynolds of pewterreport.com and Scott at this point I really don't even know what to say anymore. Well, it, Matt, I, I think you already said it. You said we're going to break it down. This thing's broken. Yeah. I mean, this thing is broken. <laughs> yeah. It, it's it's broken down, and and it needs to get fixed. And Byron Leftwich is not the guy to do it, right? And you saw in the graphic there, the Bucks lose. Leftwich has to go. Uh, Todd Bowles has got to move quickly if he wants to save his job. And I know there's plenty of Buccaneer fans out there, plenty of pewter people that want Todd Bowles to go too. But the Lasers have been known to have a quick trigger finger, but not this quick, not after right. seven games. But what Todd Bowles has to understand is we have seen a couple of regimes. The Greg Schiano regime ended after two seasons. The Lovey Smith regime ended after two seasons. And a couple of other regimes, the Dirk Cutter and the Raheem Morris regimes, ended under three seasons. So the Glaciers are impatient people, as they should be, right? I mean, there's a standard set. Todd Bowles has been part of that standard. And by and large, this team is, is regressing. And it's yeah. regressing more so on the offensive side of the ball. The defense certainly has uh, plenty of blame to, you know, to, to be pointed at that. Uh, at the same time, I can tell you just from a defensive, a former defensive coach, former defensive um player myself way way back in my high school days it's demoralizing when you're out there and you're getting stops and you're doing your part and you know and, and nothing is happening on the other side of the ball they can't get any points right it's demoralizing and then what happens you start to play hero ball you start to yeah. to try to make something happen and you get out of your gaps right and you try to go for the ball and you miss tackles those things happen they happen naturally and it sucks because that's not what these players are coached to do, but it's a natural byproduct of frustration. Yeah. And I guarantee you, if the score had been 7-7 seven seven at halftime or 10-7 Buccaneer lead, the defense probably would have played a hell of a lot better in the second half than it did. It just got to the point where it was they were frustrated, they were getting beaten, beaten down mentally. The Panthers were gaining momentum and gaining confidence. And that's that's just it. This is a momentum type sport. The Panthers had it right at the end of the first half. They got that touchdown, and and they they never let up in the second half. And that's why you saw a blowout, but not what we expected. Not not a Buccaneer blowout. The Buccaneers got blown out, Matt, and uh, it was it was disappointing. And right now, I know Todd Bowles said, and we just are putting up a story on PeterReport.com. We'll we'll tell you the the news real quick here. But uh, what he said after the game was um, when it came to the, the coaches, I'm finding the quote here, I will not consider coaching changes or I will not consider changing coaching, but I will consider what we're doing. We're def we definitely need to change some of the things we're doing. We've been discussing that. It can't happen overnight. But we've got to do a lot better than what we've been doing as a whole. Now, I will tell you, Todd Bowles is not going to come out and fire Byron Leftwich in the post game right. press conference. That's yeah. not going to happen. This isn't like Bruce Arians saying Antonio Brown, he is no longer a buck. That's not right. going to happen uh, exactly. in a post game thing. I was also quite curious as well because the Bucks have that Thursday night game. It seems like it would be tough to get rid of a coach like in yeah. the middle of a of a short week. So. In an odd way, the Thursday night game may have saved Byron Leftwich for one more week and give him another opportunity to, you know, get it on track. Because 
I mean, this has been an issue. It started from the beginning. I mean, everything changed when Mike Evans dropped that wide open pass yeah. early in the game. That demoralizing. Hit right on the hands. It was absolutely demoralizing. And, you know, I don't, you can't knock the defense a ton for the first half. Like they allowed the touch in at the end. Yeah. And that, you know, that obviously was extremely disappointing. But, you know, how many teams really get shut out on a weekly basis in the NFL? So, yeah, they messed up there. But it was only 7 nothing, and it right. felt like they were down by 35 yeah, points. It, That's just like the did. way it was. It, it did. You, you, There was no sense of hope from what this, this team was doing. Like, honestly, there was a glimmer of hope. You know when there was a glimmer of hope, Matt? There was a glimmer of hope when Luke Gedeke was benched, and they put Nick Leverett in. And I thought, thank God. Thank God this coaching staff has gotten its head out of its ass and, and, and actually realized this guy's not ready to play football right now. And Nick Leverett, to his credit, and I've got to go back and watch the film, but watching it live, I saw holes getting blown open. I, I saw he was better pass protection from Nick Leverett at left guard. And it, it only took this team to roll through four Pro Bowl defensive tackles for Luke Gedeke to, to lose those matchups to finally realize, hey, let's put Nick Leverett in. But then the same jackasses on the coaching staff decide to rotate and put Gedeke back in the game. Makes no sense. I Todd Bowles losing. needs to make some changes on offense. He needs to take control of this team and stop saying, I'm the defensive coach. I trust the offensive coaches. Don't trust them. Don't trust them when they're, when they're putting up three points per game and leaving Luke Gedeke in this game. And this is nothing personal against Luke Gedeke. He might turn out to be one hell of a, of a starting guard. He might turn out to be a, a, a Pro Bowl caliber guard. I saw it happen with Rondé Barber, who was awful, awful in 1997 as, as a third-round draft pick. So much so, he was so bad, they spent a second-round pick the next year on another cornerback, Brian Kelly, because they didn't have any confidence in Rondé Barber. And to his credit, he became a future Hall of Fame caliber player, one of the best five Buccaneers of all time. I'm not about to write off Luke Gedeke, but he's not ready now. And it's obvious for everybody to see that. And for them to, to go to Nick Leverett, great. I applaud you. Leave him in the game. There was nothing Nick Leverett did in that game that made anyone go, well, they need to change him out again. You know, exactly. that, was, you know that was going back and forth with Gedeke and, and then stupid. back to Leverett and then back to Gedeke? It was stupid and it was half-assed. Make yes. a decision and commit to it. What was exactly. the point? Oh, we need to give him a break? He just played every single snap of the first six <laughs> games of the season. Now, all of a sudden, he gets a break when he's playing against yes. a less inferior defensive lineman compared to you know all the defensive tackles that we talked about. It was a half-ass move. It was a BS yep. move. And it was BS what Todd Bowles said after the game where he was yep. like, well – you know, we want to give Nick Leverett a little bit of a look so we can give Luke Gedeke a little bit of a break because Nick Leverett almost won that job in that competition during training camp. So we want to see how he how he would do. Yeah. Fine. But then keep him in the game when you were having success. <laughs> no. The one time the Bucks ran the ball and they only had like 42 yards rushing in the whole game. The one time where they had a running back get to the second level, taking on linebackers and defensive backs, Nick Leverett was in the game and it got them a first That's down right. because there was a glimmer of, Oh my God! Yeah. They ran the ball on first right. down, so they could. Uh, sorry, they and threw you know the what? ball on first down, so they could run it on second down. You're right, Matt. And if, if you can't see during the game that Nick Leverett is outperforming Luke Gedeke, which I could, sitting on my friggin' couch here in Wesley Chapel yeah. watching the game, and I know Josh Capo and and J C Allen who were in the press box in Carolina, they saw the same thing. If you can't see that during a game, then what does that say about your ability as as a coach or a play caller? To make adjustments in a game, it's piss poor. Brandon um, uh, Mackey, uh, Mackay, sorry, don't, don't know how to pronounce your name. Uh, with the with the five uh, Canadian five, dollars, five Canadian dollar super yeah, chat. We appreciate that. North, pretty, yeah. Defense was bad in the second half. That's true, and I explained why that was. I'm not making an excuse for the defense. I'm just telling you what happens. It shouldn't happen, right? You should play hard and and play sound on every single down. I'm just telling you human nature. What did happen, right? And and it doesn't make it right. I'm not I'm not excusing the defense. I'm just telling you what happened. They tried to play some hero ball because nothing was happening on the offensive side. And, and whenever you do that, it usually backfires. It just does. But two ab abominable offensive performances against bottom feeder teams is inexcusable. Time for changes. Listen, I, I'll tell you right now. 
Todd Bowles is going to have a meeting with Jason Light probably tonight. <laughs> probably the Glaciers involved too. Um, I I would be shocked if Byron Leftwich is is the coach by this time next Monday. Matt, I agree with you. There is a chance that the Leftwich stays on through the Thursday night game. At the same time, if I'm Todd Bowles, uh, you, you got you got to every game counts, man. You got 17, you know, rounds in the chamber, right? Yeah. This is not like hockey or or Major League Baseball or the NBA where you can literally lose 10 games in a row and still win your division, right? Like you can have a, a bad month or whatever. You can lose 10 games in a row and win 10 games in a row, and, and it doesn't matter because there's so many freaking games. There's 17 in an NFL season. They all count. They all matter. And, Matt, Clyde Christensen – is is the the only guy on this coaching staff that has NFL play calling ability experience yeah. experience right now and and I would make the move and I would give Clyde a shot at it he's got the best relationship as the quarterbacks coach with Tom Brady he's 66 years old he's he's been with Bruce Arians you know longer than than Byron Leftwich has uh, in terms of coaching so dating back to Indianapolis so I, I'm I, I'm making yeah, that it makes move. Sense. Yeah, and it's a really good point. You know, the rela the relationship with Brady and the experience that he has, uh, it would make total sense. Uh, shout out to Dr uh, Trustin here for the four ninety nine super chat. Thank you very much. He says, uh, "Be honest. Do you think since Arians left, left which has the key to the kingdom and is now being exposed? Maybe bring Arians yes. back as the OC. Arians wouldn't do that, but as you yeah. pointed out in your, uh, it's either the Fab Five or last week's two point conversion. You know, Bruce Arians obviously he has a lot of loyalty to." Pretty much everyone on the coaching staff, yeah. but especially Byron Leftwich and and Todd Bowles. So Arians taking offensive coordinator yeah. means it, it ultimately would, that Byron Leftwich failed and is out right. of a job most likely. So and he keep in mind that and, for that reason. And Arians, it, you know, it, Arians is the mentor. Leftwich is his protege, right? I mean, he is the groomed, handpicked, you know, offensive guy. I mean, you've heard Bruce Arians speak about how he was so pissed. That Byron got passed over for head coaching opportunities yeah. these past two years. Byron Leftwich is Bruce Arians' protege, and I think that he would opt out of of this situation being a play caller, even though he loves Todd Bowles. He coached Todd Bowles at Temple, right? He yeah. he picked Bowles over Leftwich to be his successor, so he's got loyalty to both guys. Having said that, I, I don't think that it's within him. Um, uh, unless Todd said, you know what? I'm, I fired Byron Bruce. He's gone. Nothing you can do about it. You can't talk me out of it. I already fired him and I want you to call the plays. And I still don't know if Arians would because Arians is retired. He's also yeah. 70 years old. He's got uh, a pretty good gig right now to be, he does. To be real with he, you. He does. And I don't know if he'd want the pressure at that age yeah. to come back into this situation. You know, he, yeah. To the yeah. He's super. Oh, the, it was good last season. They won the division. And uh, we have a couple super chats to to get to. I see two more in there. But uh, yeah. first, I want to tell everyone, of course, the good word about Celsius Energy Drinks, of course, the presenting sponsor of the Pewter Report podcast and the Pewter Post Game Show. Uh, the Bucks could, the Bucks need to be energized in one way or another, and they could start by drinking uh, Celsius Energy Drinks. It's the healthy version of an energy drink. It's got seven essential vitamins and gives you that essential energy to get you through whatever you got going on in your life, whether it's a busy work day, a workout that you want to go crush, uh, Celsius Energy drinks are the way to do it. We obviously love all the different flavors from the Arctic peach to tropical vibes. You can also get a you know sparkling kiwi guava, the orange, the grape, watermelon, or a cola flavor as well if you want to go in a little bit of a different direction than um, all the fruits that they got there. Of course, go to the Celsius store locator on their website. Find out where you can get a Celsius near you or have it sent straight to your apartment or house and have it set up You know, every two weeks, three weeks, whatever you want. You're going to get that done on Amazon. Just make sure that you're drinking Celsius energy drinks, our favorite energy drink out there. That's hashtag Celsius live fit, hashtag Celsius energy. Get a Celsius, drink it, take a picture of it, send it to us on our – we will uh, – Tweet and give you a shout out. So uh, make sure you're drinking Celsius energy drinks. Uh, let me get, I saw two comments. One was from yeah. Brian Shaw, which was uh, kind of funny. He just said, uh, Arians held this inept coaching staff together. Yeah. 
I mean, right now the the coaching staff looks inept. There's it no looks bad. It certainly that. does. And yeah. they're coaching bad, and and the players are playing bad. I will say this: Bruce Arians, like Byron Leftwich, and I'm not trying to let Byron off the hook, but I'm keeping it real with facts. There's no Pro Bowl left guard Ali Marpet. There's no Pro Bowl yeah. center Ryan Jensen. There's no future Hall of Fame tight end Rob Gronkowski, and there's no Hall of Fame caliber wide receiver slash jackass diva. Antonio Brown, right? Football no, is just true. as much about the Jimmys and the Joes as as, as the X and the, and the O's. And I don't know if Bruce Arians is the head coach right now. I'm not saying it would be better or worse. I don't know. But I'm not going to automatically wave a magic wand and say, yeah, you take away those star players on offense, right? And, and maybe Bruce has a little bit more input and insight in, in terms of how to fix some things. Maybe he doesn't. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Um... I think that's fair. I still don't think that excuses them only scoring three points against the, the Carolina Panthers. Uh, thank you to 179 CPV. Thank you for the 499 super chat. They say, uh, how can there be so much miscommunication on offense seven games into the season? Brady and his receivers never seem to be on the same page. Yeah, we saw that a little bit today. Yeah. There was one play on a third down where, you know, Brady was looking to throw it down the field to Mike Evans. It was one-on-one -on -one coverage. And Evan stopped his route and Brady thought that, you know, he was going deep on the play and, yeah. you know, it obviously led to another you know third down that they did not convert. I think what's really concerning too, Scott is, you know, we saw the bucks. It, we got on Leffich's case for a lot of things yeah. this week, but one of them was the predictability. You're always running it on first down. They actually did try to mix it up a little bit. You know, they ran a sweep with Jalen Darden. They used counters and misdirection with Rashad White in the game. They threw yep. it a lot more. I don't have like the all the numbers in front of me, but it, it felt like they actually threw it a lot more on first down, either at a shotgun or in play action than they yep. had before. And they still couldn't score a touchdown. I think that right. was the most damning part of the whole thing is that they tried to mix things up. Yep. They tried to put Luke Gedeke, uh sorry, they tried to put Nick Leverett in the game, then for whatever reason went back to Gedeke. But they attempted to mix things up. And outside of Mike Evans, who obviously had the huge drop, but he also had nine receptions for 96 yards. Mike Evans was really the only guy that showed up on offense for the Bucs. Chris Godwin made some key plays, but yeah. Godwin, again, he's talking about he's separation. Just not, he's he he's not catches. back. He has five back. defensive backs around him every yeah. single time. No one got a, a an inch of separation except yeah. for Mike Edwards in this game. And Kate Odden came uh, late, but it was, yeah. you know, it was later it was late yeah. it was too late in the game by that point i i agree and, and uh, to to wd's point um i'm tuning in for insight you're just yelling listen i i'm sorry i i have a short i'm 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 an old man i've got my patience is lacking matt uh, it, it is and and the reason i say that is because we've been talking about some of the things that have to change on offense for weeks now right mm -hmm. and a yes. big part of that has been the left guard and this team is not listening and 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 we're, we're trying to help them out by pointing out some things. Don't run on first down. <laughs> Get out of 12 personnel. Your tight ends can't block reliably. Stop going to these jumbo 12 and 13 packages on, on third and short and, and trying to power the ball in there when you don't have any power players uh, you know, up front. I mean, it, it, we've talked about the first down runs being being a, a problem. Uh, it, it's It's – it's predictable, and and that's what's maddening. That's why we're yelling, and that's why we're, we're frustrated. And if Byron Leftwich, you know, is is here this week, then if he didn't like my line of questioning from last Thursday, <laughs> he's sure as hell not going to like it yeah. when I point some things out again. And and if he, you know, I'm I'm sorry, it's like he's the one that said no logic when I think what he meant to say was. When I asked him about what was his logic in, in trying to to run at Cam Hayward behind Luke Gedeke last week against Pittsburgh on third and one, that was a not that was a, a not uh, a favorable matchup. And I think what he tried to say is, "No comment. I'm not going to comment on my logic in that situation." And he mm -hmm. blurts out, "No logic," and it, it became a meme, a gif, or whatever. It just th there isn't a lot of logic to what's happening, and and that's the frustrating thing. Because, you know, I've been doing this for 27 years. Um, I, I know a lot about football because this is my profession. I'm not an expert at it by, by any stretch of the imagination. 
where I, I can be at, at an NFL coaches or players level. I'm, I'm not going to put myself uh, on that level, but I talk to players. I talk to coaches. I talk to scouts. I know enough about the game, but Matt, when, when the average football fan, when, when, when our pewter people are watching either from the stands or, or, you know, at their sports bar at walk-ons at, uh, on their couch, and they can see this stuff coming and they can call out what's going to happen based upon is co in the game. And thank God they finally yeah. threw him a pass. Right. But, <laughs> but so much of this is predictable. Right. And if the, the average Buccaneer fan can, can, you know, call this stuff out before it happens. And I give you guys a lot of credit because you're smart fans. Yeah. We do have you smart are. fans too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm not trying to dumb you down whatsoever. You're smart, but NFL defensive coordinators should be smarter, right? And they get paid hundreds of thousands of dollars, some of the millions. And if you and I can figure this stuff out, you know that they can. And that's why a one in five football team has a defense that can stop it on not just third and one, but fourth and one, right? And that's yeah. frustrating. That's maddening. And that has to stop. And Byron Leftwich has to go. That seems to be the case. Shout out Matt, 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 Matt here. Great name uh, for the yeah. $2 Super Chat. Todd and Byron are the new Cutter and Mike Smith. And you know what? We might not know as much as, uh, you know, the the and the fans as well might not know as much as, you know, the the offensive and, and defensive coordinator. I know we would like to make as much money as the offense and defensive coordinators yes. do it, overall in the NFL. And uh, one way that you could get into that category is by, you know, Winning the jackpot at the, you know, Semmel Hard Rock Tampa Casino. Just the way you like it. Me and my wife decided we'll have some fun. I was playing a two-cent machine. Six bets in, I hit a jackpot. $117,000. Hi, my name is Tara because I won over $500,000 playing slot. I do this full-time and I would not change it for the world. I'm Gloria. I won over $2 million at Seminole Hard Rock Casino. I went and bought a bunch of jewelry. <laughs> my name is Mike. I won over $350,000. I love playing back rock because it hits different. When you pull in that car and you flip over that nine, beating that eight, can't miss. I'm Jimmy. I won a half million dollars in a slot tournament at Seminole Hard Rock in Tampa. Even a blind squirrel can get a nut sometimes. <laughs> my name is Philip, and I won two hundred and fifteen thousand on Blazing Sevens. Put my last four dollars on the table. Next thing you know, bam, two hundred and fifteen thousand jackpot. I hit that bad boy. I didn't realize how much it would change my life. You only live once. Have fun with it, right? Anybody can win. It's them no hard rock in Tampa. You never know when you can win big, so hit up the Seminole Hard Rock in Tampa, where we will be doing a couple of live Pewter Report yeah. podcasts, so make sure you check that out. We'll let you know on our social media when we uh, go and do that. And, yep. you know, we saw another recurring theme with the offense in their struggles, and that was a short yardage situation. Yep. Obviously, the big play in the second half, the Bucks had third and one. They couldn't get it when they ran it up the middle with yep. Leonard Fournette. And then they tried the exact same pitch play that they converted on fourth down the week before against the Steelers. They tried it again against the Carolina Panthers. Very predictable. <laughs> Very predictable. I think Trist I would have to watch the tape again, but it looked like Tristan Wirfs may have actually missed his assignment on that play, yeah. which is you know very surprising because uh, yeah. it's Tristan Wirfs. But once again, you have two opportunities to get one, one yard. Yeah. One single effing yeah. yard. And they couldn't do it. Yeah. Despicable, disgraceful. Yeah, it is. Francisco Guzman, two of twelve on third down. That's the game right there. Yes, that that is the uh, that's it. That's the game. You you nailed it. That in the three points. Right. That's that that's bad. I, I will say that I want to address this real quick here. I know we're sticking with offense, but I, I do want to address this about uh, Todd Bowles. I just had it up here. Um I don't see it. Anyways, it, it was about since Todd Bowles took over as head coach, the defense has regressed. And, and I think there's some truth to that. And I'm just wondering if this experiment with the defensive coordinators, right, with Casey Rogers dealing with the front seven, and then you've got Larry Foote dealing with the back seven, right, the coverages and the mm -hmm. rush, and they have to kind of be married together. And I know that that game plans are, are usually collaborations. Usually it's it's not a, a committee, right, but but there is some collaboration. You want to get some insight from your assistant coaches, et cetera. 
And I know Bowles is in there, and he trusts Casey Rogers. Uh, he's coached with them for years. They're very good friends. And, and Larry Foote is an up-and-comer, and I know that there's some trust there as well. But I just wonder, is, is this, and this is a question I'm going to ask Todd Bowles tomorrow because I don't know the answer. This is just my speculation. But are, are there too many cooks in this kitchen? Uh, it, it, is that working out well? Uh, it, it doesn't seem like it. It, it, is it. Is it better if Bowles takes on all of the the coordinating responsibilities? I know he has some head coaching duties for sure, right? I mean, he is the head coach. But John Gruden was the offensive play caller, right? You had Bill Muir as the offensive coordinator. That was basically just a title. Gruden did uh, the, the yeoman's work in terms of, of putting all of that together. It was his offense, his baby. And I just wonder if Todd Bowles is not delegating too much to where there are some miscommunications on defense. I, I don't know. It, I think it's it's fair to bring it up as a question, and I look forward to asking Todd Bowles that tomorrow at his post-day uh, press conference. Yeah, that's really interesting because that was kind of like something that we talked about a little bit about with like when Jameis Winston was here at quarterback. Like you have Bruce Arians, you got Byron Leftwich, you got Clyde Christensen in his ear. Tom like, Moore. And Tom Moore. Is there just like too many cooks in the kitchen there? And obviously when Tom Brady comes here, that kind of goes away. because It's like, oh, it's Tom Brady, you know. He doesn't need that much help, but the more the merrier yeah. to help out Tom Brady. And yeah, now it could be the case really with the defense. And, you know, it's one thing when Bo says, you know, uh, we had a couple of breakdowns and that's that's what led to the, you know, the huge runs by the Panthers in the second yeah. half. But there's breakdowns every single week. I mean, you snap your fingers and teams run for like 130 plus yards yeah. against the Bucs. Like it's a... It's a theme now, okay? Yeah. This isn't just a one-week outlier. And, right. you know, we tried to cover that a little bit against the Falcons. We were like, the Falcons are a run-heavy team. They run the ball all yeah. the time. That's There's what no identity. Do. There's no identity at all. And then, unfortunately, their best player was Antoine Winfield Jr., and then he goes out with a concussion. Yeah. And uh, we, you want to talk about, you know, falling into the same pattern of mistakes, whether it was short yards for the offense? How about this? With the game on the line, it's third and eleven. Remember what happened last week against the Steelers where they kept allowing third and 15, third and 13, yeah. third and 11. What happened when the Panthers had a third and 11 near their own end zone with the game on the line? PJ Walker, who was the better quarterback today. Yeah. No doubt. Stat wise or just optics wise threw for a touchdown that essentially sealed the game. The game was already done. Right. Once the, once the Panthers got a second score, but that, you know, <laughs> turn off the lights and go home. Yeah. What, yeah. Once they got one yeah. touchdown. So yeah. No, you're right. That, that's that's a great point. Um, it, it is. We appreciate these super chats very much. Thank yeah. you, uh, pewter people. Uh, Michelle, so doesn't Brady have a say in any of this and and the plays being called? I can't believe that he is tolerating this. Yeah, I mean, he, he does. It's not like he gets off scot-free. Uh, he, he didn't. I mean, listen, he threw. He had a, some poor throws today. He did. Like, he he had a beautiful awful, pass. But- to Mike Evans, the Mike Evans dropped, and then there was one where six foot five Mike Evans is skying up in the air, and, and the ball was thrown slightly behind him and too high, and it didn't need to be right. And and the pass protection at the most inopportune time just breaks down. Whether it's Lou Gedicki, whether it's Shaq Mason, Donovan whether it's Smith, Robert Hainsey, Donovan sack. Smith did not have a good uh, game today. Uh, it's it's just bad that this team does not have a lot of confidence right now. And and I will say this. I don't know that Ndamukong Sue, the player, is missed. But Ndamukong Sue, the attitude, the leadership, Jason Pierre-Paul, Ryan Jensen. Uh, his, his leadership, Ryan Jensen. Yeah, the, these, these are Those guys. Are three guys that it's go, attitude, Matt. it's keeping people accountable. Yes. And I again, talent-wise, it, it's you don't really miss that necessarily with like JPP or Sue. But the attitude, the attitude yeah. they are missing – tenfold yeah. there is no excuse when you have the talent that the bucks yeah. have on both sides of the football it's not just the offense there's right. no excuse when they get weekly performances like this and you see yeah. a team like the new york giants that are now six and one and have daniel jones as their quarterback and like no offensive weapons outside of saquon barkley yeah and they are a six and one football team right. as uh john paul Iwanog says attitude is lacking. They're yeah. missing attitude. It goes back to what Russell Gage said last this week, Scott, about they're dead. Even when they make <laughs> yeah. a play, they're absolutely dead yeah. on the inside. And you know what? 
I think you're seeing it from the coaching staff too. I was so confused when the Bucks are down 14 nothing and they actually get it into the red zone. Yeah. And they went for it on fourth down and got it. And then you have it at the eight yard line and they it was an incomplete pass on third and goal. Yeah. And they decide to line up for a field goal when you're down 14 points and you need touchdowns and it keeps it a two possession game. What on earth was that? What are we? Oh, well, we're not going to get shut out. It's going to look better. No, no it's I, not. I, I, I think, and listen, I, I would have rather seen them go for the touchdown, right? Yeah. I would have. But if, if, I, if I'm being honest and I try to keep my analysis as, as honest as I can be, Tom Brady went 0 for 3 from the 8-yard line. And two of those yeah. were just throw it in the dirt, right? Right. Two, third two. down. Yeah. I mean, he didn't even take a shot to the end zone. The, the end zone's 8 yards away. Okay, the ball was not thrown into the end zone, I don't believe, on any of those those trips or on, on any of those passes on that trip. Okay, so you have to get it into the end zone. Something's happening. Receivers aren't getting open. Protection's not there. Tom's not seeing it. I know Russell Gage popped open late. I don't necessarily blame him for, for not seeing that. Um, it, I don't have any level of confidence that on fourth and eight, Tom Brady is going to find the end zone and, and there's going to be an open receiver and that receiver is going to catch it. I just don't. And so if anything, you get three points there. Okay. Then you get a touchdown. And, and then of course you go for two, which this team sucks at, but hi hypothetically you go for two, right? With your touchdown. Now you're at 11. Now a field goal, another field goal, because Ryan suck up's your best player. Now you, you tie the game with another field goal, right? If you if you kept them to 14. That didn't happen, of course. Bucks didn't find the end zone and and they didn't keep the Panthers out of the end zone. They scored that late touchdown, yeah. as you mentioned, Matt. But I think that was the, the thinking. Whether it was correct thinking, logical thinking, I'll leave that to you guys to decide. But I think that's what that's what Todd Bowles said is at some point in time, because we are dead on offense, we have to get something something's better than nothing. And I don't think it was for the sake of, well, we want to avoid getting shut out. It's let's get some frigging points. Let's get something going. Let's get some semblance of confidence, momentum, et cetera. But at the end of the day, and it goes back to this, Byron Leftwich has to go. This offense is not going to get any better. I wrote about that on my SR's Fab Five. I mean that wholeheartedly. I, I don't think that, that Leftwich is the right guy for the job. And and in the change needs to happen as soon as possible. I, I think that that he does not know how to turn this around. I don't have any confidence that Byron Leftwich knows how to turn this around. Certainly, if you look at at the the point production, Matt, to go from what twenty one points against the Falcons, who are not that good of a football team, right, to eighteen points against a lesser team, the Pittsburgh Steelers to three points against, against an even lesser team <laughs> in the Carolina Panthers. You're not heading in the right direction. There's no evidence that Byron Lepish knows how to turn this around. None. So why wait? No, yeah. It, you know you know what? You uh, The whole electing to kick the field goal there, you 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 talked me off the ledge a little bit. So it, it makes a I'm little not bit. Saying, I'm not saying I'm right, Matt. I mean, I listen, right. I, I you need a touchdown. And, and, and my whole thing is, is if you do want some momentum, the, the touchdown would have given you more than the field goal for sure. But, but if, if you, if you, if you miss there and, and it's, you, you go over four on, on four shots from the eight yard line, you're just not scoring again. You are just not, it's right. It's dead. You're over. And at that point in the game, it just, they're, they're done. And it turned out they were done anyways. So yeah. maybe it wouldn't have hurt to go for the touchdown. I don't know. I, I'm not, I'm not saying that it was it was the bad call. I'm just telling you what what the math logic was behind it. Get the field goal there, get the touchdown. Of course, we'll get the two point conversion, right? Yeah, yeah. No, they so haven't struggled. Yeah, they yeah they haven't struggled with that at yeah, all. Come on. Yeah, uh, there's another coaching moment that happened later in the game that uh, I want to talk about as yeah. well. But first, let's talk about our favorite oh, beer, man. the official beer of the Pewter Report podcast and, of course, pewterreport.com. And that's Pirate Republic beer, which I think all Bucks fans could really use right now after <laughs> yes. watching that 
<laughs> just disastrous, disastrous, yeah. awful performance. But uh, yeah. Pirate Republic is based out of Nassau, Bahamas. They're now invading Florida just in time for football season. Beer brings people together to celebrate life, and that means celebrating life in the spirit spirit of the original Pirate Code. Uh, and that's a sense of belonging. Uh, Pirate Republic is a community of people living life on their terms. The Long John Pilsner, my personal favorite, is perfect for tailgating or having fun at the beach in the Florida sun. You also have the Take No Quarter IPA, which is the best IPA around that you'll drink. You could also drop an orange slice in the Golden Haze of Piracy Belgian Wit Beer and enjoy that pirate life. Pirate Republic beer is available at participating retailers like Total Wine and more, Loop Party, and maybe liquor stores in the greater Tampa Bay area and is expanding across the state of Florida. I get my Pirate Republic beer from ABC Liquors. Uh, so mm -hmm. live life on your terms and drink like a pirate with Pirate Republic beer, the official beer of pewterreport.com. There was another, as I just said, another coaching moment that annoyed me. It was later in the game, and I understand that the game was, you know, somewhat over at this point, especially yeah. after the Bucks got the stop on third down with about three and a half minutes to go, and then Jannard right. Avery was called for the the roughing the kicker. But yeah. the Bucks get another stop right after the two-minute warning, and they have all three timeouts. And I understand that, you know, the game was close to over then. Right. But they just let the clock keep winding down. I'm like, why aren't you calling a timeout and at least yep. showing some balls and fighting to the end? They laid over, they rolled over, and died. That's what they did. They had three timeouts in his pocket, didn't use one. In the second half. And again, I understand there's like two minutes left. You're down 21 to three. But I mean, you're Buccaneers. Go down with the ship. If you get what I'm saying. I mean, yeah, I call agree. that time out. Keep moving the ball down the field. I mean, <laughs> we called for it. What was it? Two years ago when they absolutely got decimated by the Saints. And it was like, why is Tom Brady still in the game? Like, put yeah. in Blaine Gabbert when this one's over. Right. At least this one, if you're going to keep Brady in, keep moving the ball down the field. Try something. Go yeah. down swinging. And they absolutely did not. They just said, all right, we've had enough. Let's let the clock run out and, and we're going to end it. I just, it, I don't know. I didn't like that move. I, I didn't like the mindset either, Matt. I thought about that. And again, it's like, I, I, I'm agreeing with you. Like, I agree with you about the touchdown. I'm just explaining the rationale. Hey, yeah, right? I got you. I got and, you. And, and I agree with you about this too. I think the only rationale is... We just lost our best defensive player in Antoine Winfield to a concussion, right? Mm. And if you remember back at that Saints game, what happened at the very end of that Saints game, Levante David had that Liz Frank foot injury, literally like two or three plays left in the game, right? Like anything can happen. You can get rolled up on in a pile. I think at that point in time, it was almost like running clock. We're not going to win this game. We don't have enough time. It's, it's taken 11 plays to march down the field to get to the friggin' eight-yard line. We don't have that much time or that many plays. Uh, let's just, you know, wave the white flag of surrender, which is the unpirate thing to do. But but probably when, you're, when your secondary is missing, Carlson Davis, Mike Edwards is playing hurt, Sean Murphy Bunting is out. Now you've lost Antoine Winfield, right? I think that Todd Bowles was just like, let's just not get anybody else hurt, right? Russell Gage had the hamstring injury at the end. Mike Evans got tweaked a little bit. Don't think it's anything serious. But, um, you know, Zion McCollum, man, it's this guy, he looked like yeah. a rookie from Sam Houston today. I mean, just some basic things. And I know that he can jump out of the gym and he's incredibly fast, obviously not fast enough to catch up to Tommy Trumbull there on the touchdown. But, <laughs> But the thing about Zion McCollum is it, you've got to play contain on defense, especially in the run game, right? And that big 60-yard run by, from Dante Foreman was was right at him. I think he gave up two big runs, and you, you can't do that. Uh, that. That goes back to playing cornerback at the Pop Warner level. That's, that's the one thing yeah. we did was we found – Two of our best tacklers, and we stuck him out at corner. Not because they could cover wide receivers, but because the sidelines, that's the danger zone. Because uh, as you, when you're a defender, all of your all of your help, your friends, are to the inside of the field. You don't want to give up that alleyway. And that's exactly what happened today, and you can't have that. And that's one thing Todd Bowles mentioned after the game was he was talking about players, uh, whether they're, they're rookies or whether they are you know, veteran players, uh, you know, they've they've got to, to step up and and, you know, he, he kind of challenges players after the game and and we'll see. And, and you know, 
talk is cheap, but he's right. Yeah. This team lacks some mental toughness, and I honestly I think it lacks some really good leadership. I think Levante is a good leader. I think Brady is a good leader. Um, I, I don't see Mike Evans being a vocal leader. He is more of, of a lead of by a example. lead by example guy. But some of the other guys, like Vita Vea, but he's not a leader. Devin White, honestly, he's a he's a, a, a pregame pep talk kind of guy. I don't know that he's a great leader. He had five tackles today, and I guarantee he missed at least five if I go back and watch the, the film. It was an awful day from Devin yeah. White. He'll miss 10 tackles. He'll make one, and then he gets up, and he rides the horse, and he yeah. like, does all that oh, stuff. Great. That, um, that's awesome. But Yeah, the, I, I, I wouldn't say the, Devin White's like a selfish player, but he is a lot about him. He's a me player, yeah. And, yeah. and the, the thing is, is to be a good leader, you have to be a good player, right? You can't sit there and rally the troops and say, come on, guys, we got to do this when you're out there missing tackles, when, when, you, when you're blowing assignments, right? That's yeah. not leadership. Leadership is – is doing everything right to to the fullest extent and then say, I need you to play like me. It's yeah. hard to be a leader when when Shaq Barrett has not gotten a sack since week two, right? Shaq when Barrett is, uh, you know, it's perfect because it's Halloween season because he's a ghost. Like, he's yeah. nowhere to be found. The, the one time I noticed Shaq Barrett is when they had him in coverage on DJ Moore. And right. DJ Moore caught a ball for a, a first down. Yeah. Shaq is nowhere to be found. That, that's as close as he got today. That, that yeah. That's a completed pass from P.J. Walker, believe it or not. That's as close as he got. You know, yeah, there's, there's Vita Vea getting shoved around in the run game. Yes, he had one sack on third down. Great. You made one play at a 62 on defense. That's awesome. But that's not getting the job done on a regular basis. And yeah, yeah. The, the Bucks absolutely need more like rah rah type of guys. Cause a lot of the guys we mentioned are lead by example guys. They're a little bit quiet and you know, that's okay, but you do need that, that player that's absolutely going to pump you up and like, you know, but, but we, they we have were, to play well. That's the yeah. thing. It's like well, Devin White can go out there and yell and scream and, and hype everybody up. But when he goes out there and makes five tackles, you know, against a team that ran for 200 yards on you, right. Or, or damn, we're, we're yeah. close to it. And, and, and you miss five tackles, like, th that doesn't carry any water. Yeah, the Bucks' most vocal guy is Nacho. But Nacho, we love Nacho, but, he, you know, he's a role player on the defensive line. He can't yes. be your de facto, hey, let's get loud, let's get back into this. But he kind of is that guy just because you don't really have anyone else there. And, you know, Devin White, like you said, he's just – he's not making plays right now. He hasn't made plays for a couple of weeks, and – that's why allowing 150, 170 plus rushing yards per game is the norm now for the Bucs. Yeah. There was a time where if you got 75 rushing yards against the Bucs, that would be impressive. Yeah. Now it's a disappointment if you get anything under 125 rushing yards. Right. It's crazy well, how it's it's flipped. You're right. And, and again, Matt, it goes to team football, complementary football. Part of the reason why... So many times teams had to give up on the runs because they were behind, right? Because yeah. Brady in this offense and even Jameis Winston and some of the, I mean, that offense in 2019 was averaging around 27, 28 points per game, right? So mm -hmm. they got in, into some shootouts and, you know, and Jameis did throw for 5,000 yards. You can't take that away from him. Plus 33 touchdowns to go along with the 30 picks, but it was a more prolific offense for sure in 2019. Because you had better offensive line up front, that's where it all starts. At, at the same time, when you have an offense that that gives you the lead, right? That's when you see teams run the ball less and have to throw more, and that's what Todd Bowles wants ultimately. But that was not the case today. I mean, like you said, Matt, and rightly so. PJ Walker was the better quarterback out there, statistically speaking. And, but the Panthers, yeah, to, you know, Dante Foreman went over 100 yards. He came into this game with, what, 37 yards? <laughs> yeah, and he wasn't even the starter. Chuba Hubbard was the right. starter. And then Foreman kind of, uh, you know, closed it out at the end. Yeah. Um, let's uh, let's hear a message because I we need a break from the box just doing what they did today. So let's yeah. hear a message from our friends at Age Rejuvenation. As we age, our hormones decrease, both for men and women. I was tired all the time, had no sex drive. I was groggy. I felt like I was 80 years old because everything hurt. I came to Age Rejuvenation because 
I was tired all the time. Bioidentical hormones has really made such an impact in people's lives. I actually enjoy shopping now. Got my, all my energy back. Mind is sharp. I feel like I'm 18 again. It was perfect for me. Get with age rejuvenation. Do it now. Don't wait. Call age rejuvenation today. Matt, I think that we have to, <laughs> we've got to get the Buccaneers some uh, like, like cases of Celsius and some yeah. age rejuvenation <laughs> uh, to rejuvenate this team because boy, boy, do they need it. And then for all the Buccaneer fans, we just need to just, if we had the resources, we would give you all Pirate Republic beer, like free on yeah. us. If we had the resources <laughs> to do it, we would give you guys cases and cases of beer for having to watch this crappy football team. But we greatly appreciate you all tuning in to the Pewter Report podcast and listening to our insight and, and reading your comments and hearing you vent and hearing us vent. And hopefully together we'll all get it better, right? That's that's the whole point. Speaking of better, if you want to feel better, go to Age Rejuvenation. That's what I've done. That's what John Gilmore, former Bucks tight end, has done. We both have lost weight. We feel great. And the reason why is because of Age Rejuvenation. They're the new sponsor for my SR's Fab Five column. You've seen them as the presenting sponsor of the Celsius Peter Report tailgate show on every game day. Well, I'm an age rejuvenation customer too. And thankfully, I don't have any issues in the bedroom, but I turned 50 this year and energy has become a problem for me. Not just this year, but honestly, looking back years ago, turns out I've got low testosterone. That's something that gradually decreases over time. As we age, man, it's just nature. That's just how it works. Low testosterone affects everything from weight loss to energy to stamina. But now there's a new way to fight it. And that's what I did with the testosterone therapy. And John's done that as well. I have more energy. I honestly feel like I'm 40 rather than 50. It turns back the clock for you, folks. It does. Don't wait. Don't be stupid like I was and just, I'm getting older and, and deal with it. Go to agerejuvenation.com, sign up for a free complimentary consultation. Age Rejuvenation has got five Tampa Bay area locations to serve you. Lose weight and feel great with Age Rejuvenation. So normally I don't like when the Bucks have to play on Thursday night football because, like, you know, you have a shorter week, players are yeah. banged up. It's clearly a, just a money grab by the NFL. But, you yeah. know, when Jeff Bezos and Amazon is going to pay you whatever that deal was, $100 billion. Pigeons. I understand it. So most of the time, I don't like when, you know, the team we cover has to play on Thursday. But because the Bucks looked so awful today, yeah. I almost think it's, and, you know, for fans too, it sucks. Your team loses. You have to wait a whole week before they go out right. and play again. So <laughs> it's kind of nice that it's, it's a quick turnaround. Yeah. The bad news is that they're playing the Baltimore Ravens, who, you know, are an electric team with the Mar Jackson as their quarterback. Right. Clearly the best competition that they've played since they lost to uh, Kansas the Kansas City, City Chiefs. Yeah. So the Bucks, in a weird way, you know, even you know, the 2020 season when they won the Super Bowl, they tend to do this thing where they play up and down to their competition. So, you know, going into this game against the Ravens, clearly the Bucs are going to be the underdog with the way that they played the yeah. last two weeks. But I almost, I have no, like, reasoning to to back it up because the offense has been terrible the defense has had their lapses but they do play better against like tougher competition so i'm curious to see how much the bucks can really bounce back this week on thursday yeah you know and todd bowles alluded to that a little bit uh, in his post-game press conference today uh you know he uh, you know I, I do like accountability i hate people that pass the buck and honestly i i kind of feel like like byron leftwich because he doesn't own this. Uh, he no, just he says, says the same crap all the time. Yeah. I, it's so I, disingenuous. I, I said it, this on Thursday's is. podcast. It's yeah. extremely disingenuous. Yeah. So it, listen, talk is cheap at the end of the day. It's all about actions. But I do appreciate the straightforwardness from Todd Bowles. And this is what he had to say. This is one of his quotes after the game. We as a team, starting with me and the coaches and the players have to be accountable as well. It's a dark day for us losing the way we did and the mistakes that we had that we shouldn't have had. You can't do anything but pick your shirt up by the tail. We own it. We have to own it as a man. We have to stand up here and own it and make no excuses. We just have to start digging, like digging out of the uh digging out of the hole rather than digging their grave, Matt. I think that's what Don <laughs> Bowles was trying to say. Yeah. But um but then he also said toughness. We have to have mental toughness and mental fortitude, 
The older guys have to prove they can still play, and the younger guys have to prove they can be long. And the coaches have to get better every day. That's really it, toughness, mental toughness. And, and, and I agree. It's when, when, uh, when things are not going your way, like I, I, I tell, I, I tell my, my kids, I got a bunch of teenagers, right? I mean, and we, we've all been through the teen years. You can kind of get lost sometimes, right? Like you're not sure what you're going to do. It's kind of scary sometimes graduating from high school and you don't know where you want to go to college or what you want to do with your life. I mean, we're supposed to have all these answers, right? And nobody really does. And maybe you go to college and end up switching your major like I did, uh, Three years in, that's not the ideal situation. Wow. But I, Holy but, crap. Yeah. Yeah, I, I did. I went from marketing <laughs> to PR, public relations, and just uh, couldn't pass any math classes. But my point is this, and I tell them, if you're lost, right, don't just sit there in the forest and wait for somebody to come rescue you because uh, you're going to stay lost, right? Yeah. Start walking. Find a creek. Find a river. Find a road. Find a trail and follow that and eventually you'll get unlost unless you're, you know, dropped in the middle of the Everglades, then you're pretty much screwed and going to be eaten by alligators. But I was going to say an anaconda, but yes. Also, yeah. Yeah. Or, you know, choke by an anaconda. But yeah. if you are in a forest and you're lost, just start walking and, and you'll, you'll eventually find your way, but that requires you doing something. Cause if you don't do anything, you're going to remain lost. And that's my concern right now with Todd Bowles, this coaching staff is if, he doesn't do anything, namely take the play calling duties away from Byron Leftwich and give them to Clyde Christensen, Tom Moore, Bruce Arians, whoever, somebody different. If you don't do something different, you're going to get the same outcome. And that, my friends, is the definition of insanity. Doing the same thing, <laughs> expecting a different result. It doesn't happen. That was a good point. That, that was a that was a good way of uh, you know comparing everything, finding your way. And another place that you should be finding your way at is at uh, the Walk Ons in Wesley Chapel for Thursday when we have the Pewter Report Tailgate Show, uh, the Celsius Pewter Report Tailgate Show uh, presented by Age Rejuvenation and live from the Walk Ons at Wesley Chapel. That'll be starting at six fifteen, and then we will have the Pewter Game Day Show with uh, myself starting at 8.15. And, you know, whether the Bucks are good, bad, ugly, uh, we have a lot of fun doing it's it. It's going to be entertaining. And, yeah, Scott and Bailey and, and John were uh, fantastic today on the tailgate show. Um, I had an absolute blast today with uh, our intern, Adam Slavon, and Bailey came on as well. And, and Len Martez, uh, our old friend, was uh, was also on the tailgate show. So the three of them, it was great talking with them and, even as even as egregious as the Bucks played, uh, we laughed through the pain. You know, we laughed yeah. through the pain and still had a good time. And uh, appreciate everyone in the comments. So yeah, we'll be back at it on uh, Thursday for the uh, Pewter Tailgate Show and of course the Pewter Game Day Show as well. And yeah. we have a busy week coming up. Obviously, we right. we will have our podcast tomorrow yeah. at four o'clock. Roll call around four twenty and. We get uh, quicker access this week with the Bucks playing on a short week yep. on Thursday. So we get uh, Bowles tomorrow. We'll get Bowles and, uh, and and Brady as well this week, a little bit earlier. Typically, yep. we talk to Brady on Thursday. We'll get him on on Wednesday this week. Right. We'll speak to Byron as well. So a lot of a lot of great and, and fun things coming up, mm -hmm. and we'll see if the Bucks can improve. I don't. Yeah. I don't know so, until they start letting go coaches. But yeah. <laughs> I know. So stay tuned to PeterReport.com. We've got four stories up. I'll have my two-point conversion up later tonight. We'll have the Bucks Money Mailbag tomorrow. If you have not asked your question, please do so on Twitter. Use the hashtag PR Mailbag. And uh, I pick usually about a handful of good questions and answer those first thing Monday morning. We'll have... Um, uh, a lot of post-game analysis. Yeah. Yep. Post -game -game analysis. Too. Yeah. A lot of post-game stuff tomorrow on this short week, as Max, as Matt said, we're, we're not going to change the schedule up this week. We're going to have podcasts tomorrow, Monday at four o'clock. And then also Wednesday at four o'clock, which is the day before the game. And then we'll have our Peter tailgate show, as Matt talked about at the Wesley chapel walk-ons. Uh, and then we'll have Peter game day. And then Friday we will have, another Peter report uh, podcast. And so that that's going to be our schedule this week, Monday, Tuesday, I'm sorry, Monday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. And then we'll take the weekend off.
Yeah, so really the only thing that changes is that we have a, a Friday podcast. Yep. That's really the only thing that changes. And, of course, we'll have the aftermath of the, the Bucks ravens game, what Todd Bowles has to say, what coaches are still around uh, after that game. And uh should be a lot of fun stuff. Once again, we really appreciate everyone yes. that watches and listens to this. You know, we've had coverage since 11 o'clock this morning yep. until right now. We have some really, truly awesome fans that we really appreciate it. We love, love you, it guys. When you guys are in the yes. chat. You guys appreciate your passion. Yeah, yes. appreciate the passion, even even through the bad times, which yeah. things are pretty bad for the Bucks right now. But yeah, we're gonna hang in there. We're gonna yeah, stick we're, together. Yeah, we're gonna exactly. make sure and, we apply enough pressure to get this thing turned around to make you all happy again. Yeah, yeah, and make us appreciate the good times when the when the Bucks start playing better. So, uh, yeah. For until then, till uh, next show tomorrow. For Scott Reynolds, I'm Matt Matera saying thank you everybody for watching, and we'll see you tomorrow for another edition of the Peter Report podcast. Out. Change is needed.